All right, well, welcome back to our this week's edition of the Pastor's Bible Study. You may have been looking around on YouTube last week and you say, Pastor, I couldn't find it. I don't know where it was, but I looked in the Pastor Bible Study playlist on YouTube and I didn't find it. That wasn't your fault. That wasn't because you weren't able to search around YouTube well enough. It wasn't there. I We had a meeting last week. Jeannie and I attended the virtual annual meeting of the International Baptist Convention last week. And that was on Tuesday and Wednesday afternoons. That was all afternoon Zoom meetings. And as good as those meetings were, and as awesome as it is to hear what God is doing in our family of churches called the International Baptist Convention, a four or five hour Zoom meeting two days in a row is every bit as painful as it sounds. But we were blessed to be a part of it to hear some of the reports and be able to rejoice with our brothers and sisters in Christ around the International Baptist Convention. But because of those meetings, I had some things I had to do Monday that I normally would have done Tuesday or Wednesday, so I wasn't able to get to the Bible study, but we're back at it today. Now, I've got my cup of coffee with me here, and I've got my copy of the Word of God, and I hope that you have yours as well. As I've been saying all along, I want you to have a Bible with you, when we go through these verses and we go through these topics, don't just take my word for what I'm saying. Open up the Word of God. See it for yourself. Paul said of the Bereans, I mentioned this a couple weeks ago, he went from Thessalonica to Berea and he said of the Bereans, they were more noble-minded because they searched the Scripture every day to see if what he said wasn't so. Search the Scriptures for yourself. The other thing I want you to do in these Bible studies, and this is why I'm flipping through the Bible, pulling up those verses is, along with you, is I want you to get practice doing that. And it's okay, by the way, if you have to look in the table of contents right now to find out, all right, where he said we're going to Ezekiel, where is Ezekiel? Open up the table of contents if you need to. Keep your finger there to start with. And hopefully as we spend more time here in the Word of God, flipping through it, looking for different passages. You'll have to do that less and less as you become more familiar with where things are in the Bible. I want you to be able to do that. Listen, before we jump into the message today or the, the study today, I want to just say a word uh, about tomorrow's election in the United States. If you were in our service yesterday, this is what I said to the congregation yesterday, but I want to reiterate it for those who were in the service and then if you weren't able to make it yesterday, I just want to say a word about tomorrow's elections. I, as, a, as a preacher, as a pastor, uh, my task is to proclaim the Word of God. And so it's not that I don't have political opinions, I don't have thoughts about candidates or issues, but in a forum like this or in the church service, I will not talk about specific candidates. I will not stump for any one candidate over the other. But here's what I will say about the election. Vote. If you haven't yet, you haven't sent in your, your ballot, um, send it in, vote. Those of us, particularly in the military community, if you're active duty, you're watching this, or you work for the military, I'm retired military, and if you are somehow affiliated with the military or a veteran, you've worn the uniform to secure that right. And so take advantage of that, because there are people around the world that don't have that right, but they would give anything to be able to cast their vote. So don't let that opportunity go by vote. Before you do that though, evaluate those candidates and evaluate their positions by the Word of God. Always let this be our standard for evaluating everything in society. Let's not take the Word of God and reevaluate it by society's opinions or by our political positions. Let's evaluate those things by the Word of God. And then once you do that, pray and vote. And then listen, regardless of who wins in the elections tomorrow, and there are a lot of people, the presidential election, a lot of Congress seats are up for election. Regardless of who wins, pray. Pray for those people. This is what Paul said to Timothy. 1 Timothy chapter 2. See, right off the bat, pull out your Bible and turn there. Even thinking about the election tomorrow, 1 Timothy chapter 2, this is what Paul said. First of all, then, 
I urge that entreaties and prayers, petitions and thanksgiving be, be made on behalf of all men. Listen, for kings and all who are in authority, so that we may lead a tranquil and quiet life in all godliness and dignity, this is good and acceptable in the sight of God. Regardless of who wins that election, it begins with God's people humbling ourselves, turning from our sins, seeking God's face, and praying if we want to see God heal our land. And that begins with the people of God. You be in prayer for whoever wins the election tomorrow because what we want, what we're asking, is that God helps them be responsive to him, that they would be responsive to him, lead our nation in a godly direction, in a way that, in, that pleases him and puts a smile on his face. And that's only going to happen by the power of prayer. So you be in prayer for whoever wins the election tomorrow. All right, that's a preamble. That's free stuff today. That, that's not even part of the study. We are continuing in our study, kind of going along this book here, 20 Things, 20 Basics Every Christian Should Know by Dr. Wayne Grudem. We're using this as a guide. We're not going exactly through it, but we're using it as a guide for some topics and some thoughts. Um, and I kind of seem to have lost my mouse here. Last couple of weeks, we have talked about what is the Bible? That was one of the questions that we dealt with, and we, and we talked through that, what the Bible is. And then we spent three sessions talking about what is God like? Now, this, this morning, it's noon, it's not morning anymore, but today, uh, I want to talk about what is man. That's the next topic. What is man is important because it tells us some things about God as our creator, and it tells us the significance and the role that God intended for man. And so here's what I want us to look at over these next few minutes together. I want us to look at God's purpose for creating man. What are we here for? Listen, that's a question that has plagued the minds of philosophers for centuries. Why are we here? What's the meaning of life? What's the purpose? Why did God create man? I want to talk about the nature of man as God created us to be. What did he create us to be like? What is our nature? Talk a little bit about God's activity to restore man. It's no surprise to any of us that we are not what God had created us to be. We are not performing, so to speak, in a way that God created us to perform. And then I want to talk about our responsibility as God's image bearers, what that means and what our responsibilities. I don't know if we're going to get to all that today, but we're going to cover as much as we can. And if we have to split this up into two lessons, then we'll do that. So join me in a word of prayer, and then let's dig into this topic of what is man. Father, thank you that we can once again open your word. We can learn about you and learn about what you created us to be and how you created us to, to interact and relate to you. And so, Father, as you are our teacher, you are our guide, you are the one that inspired your word, you put your, your spirit within us as believers, and so, Father, let this be a holy moment as we open up your word and we are taught by you and taught by your truth. Would you bless these few moments we have together, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, what is man? A lot of stuff for us to talk about, and as we talked about when we were studying the, the topic of what is God like, Boy, we really, even in three lessons, just scratch the surface of what God is like. And I'm not so full of myself so as to think that we are going to cover in absolute completeness what is man in this lesson. But I want us to talk about some key aspects of what man is like. So, first thing, man was created with a purpose. As I mentioned, that's been a question that has, that has haunted the minds of philosophers for centuries now, and that is, what is the meaning of life? Why are we here? Why are any of us here? I think that's what John Paul Sartre said. Why, why is man here? Why do we even exist? We talked about what is God like in the last set of lessons. We learned something significant about God. I'm sorry, I've got the hiccups now. 
we've learned something significant about God, and that is that God is independent from his creation. That is, that he is, first of all, complete in himself. He doesn't need anything from creation. And we look there in Acts chapter 17, where it just comes out and says that. That God is not served by human hands. He does as though he needs anything from us. And we talked about the fact that sometimes people say that God created mankind because he was lonely. He wanted to have fellowship. He wanted somebody to hang out with. He needed someone to interact with. And so God created man because he was lonely. But as we looked at the independence of God and we looked at the fact that he doesn't need us, we need him. And if that were to be true, that God created man because he was lonely, then it would mean that God is not completely independent from creation. He needs creation as much as creation needs him, but that is certainly not true. And you remember we looked at at Jesus's high priestly prayer in John chapter 17. I just want to remind you of what it says. So flop so flip your bible open there, John 17. John 17 and verse 5. This is Jesus in his what we call the high priestly prayer. He's speaking to the Father. And he says, "Now, Father, glorify me together with yourself with the glory which I had with you." before the world was. And then over in verse 24, he says, Father, I desire that they also, whom you have given me, be with me wherever I am, so that they may see my glory, which you have given me, for you loved me before the foundation of the world. And you remember we looked at that and we said, listen, God was not lonely. God is not lonely without us. God doesn't need us. We need him. He is perfectly fulfilled within himself in the Trinity. Always has been before the foundation of the world. And that really just helps us understand that we think about why God created man. Maybe the first thing we talk about is why God did not create man. And that was certainly not because he was lonely or he lacked fellowship or there was something that was missing in God's life that he absolutely had to have us. Okay, but that didn't answer the question, did it? That talked about why God did not create man, but it didn't really answer the question of why he did. Now, here's what the Bible says, that man was created for God's glory. Now, these times, right, these days, are all about man's glory. Right? We all, we all think that we're just going through life to, to make ourselves happy. Or, or to be the best you that you can be and, and just go through life and, and do whatever it is that makes you happiest. And it's all about me and all about man's glory. We are the center of things, we think. But man was not created for man's happiness. God's not anti-happiness. Man was not created for man's own fulfillment. God's not anti-fulfillment. But we find fulfillment and we find happiness when we are pursuing God's glory. Okay, so grab your Bible. Isaiah chapter 43. Flip back in the Old Testament. Psalms, Proverbs, Song of Solomon, Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 43. Why I love me some Isaiah. Isaiah is he can bring down the thunder. <laughs> But then he can also just, just be so, so terribly profound in the things that God says through him. And this is God speaking through Isaiah in Isaiah chapter 43. Everyone who is called by my name and whom I have created, listen, for my glory. Did you hear what he said there? I have created for my glory. Now, that's what you and I are created for. We are created for God's glory, to bring glory to him. Now, think about what that means. To bring glory to God means that our lives are to magnify him. Our lives are to make him great 
make him greater and more seen in this world. That's what we are to do. We flip over into the New Testament, Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 11 and 12. Paul said this, Also we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to his purpose. Now he's talking about the purpose, right? What's the purpose of the meaning for which God created us, did anything for us? We were predestined according to his purpose, who works all things after the counsel of his will, to the end that we who were first to, uh, to hope in Christ would be to the praise of his glory. God created us for his glory. In Christ he recreated us for his glory. Listen, that's the reason that we exist, for the glory of God. I don't know about you, but when you get a new product, I'm not the kind of guy that reads the owner's manual. I mean, I have it, and I look at it, and I say, well, that's kind of nice, but I set it aside, and I play with that thing until I get it to work. My wife, Jeannie, on the other hand, she reads the owner's manual front to back before she even pushes the power button on that product. And I think to myself, as I'm playing away with it, I think, what a waste of time. Just get in there. Just play with the product. But Jeannie knows things that that product can do that I often don't know. And she understands how to get the most out of it when it is fulfilling its purpose. There are a lot of people in this world that are unhappy. And a lot of people that are pursuing and trying to find happiness in a lot of things. And some, sadly, some people are, are so unhappy, they turn to things like drugs or alcohol or sex or relationships or whatever to try to, to be fulfilled. But the reality is that unless we get this, that, that we are not, when we're pursuing those things, we're not operating in the way that the owner's manual says we ought, we ought to. We're not checking the owner's manual to find our purpose. And in the same way that Jeannie gets the most out of those products because she understands the purpose. When you and I understand that our purpose in life, what God created us for, was not to seek our own happiness, was not to seek our own fulfillment, but was to seek his glory. All we are. And all we are intended to do is to bring glory to God. Now, I think that brings up an important question. I was having an internet Facebook messenger debate with an, a young atheist friend of my niece several years ago. And we were talking about this issue, the purpose of man and that God created man for his own glory. And, and the young man asked me this question. He said, well, isn't it wrong or selfish for God to seek glory for himself? And I think we, when we hear the phrase that we were created solely to bring glory to God, he created us for that purpose. I mean, maybe somewhere in our minds, certainly for the opponents of Christianity, but maybe it's a question you've asked yourself. Is it wrong of God to seek his own glory, glory for himself? I said, no, absolutely not. It is not wrong. Because listen, think about it this way. He is the only one who truly deserves glory. So it's not wrong that he should get it. It's proper that he should get it. Okay, so think of it this way. Compare this to your paycheck, right? You go to work and you work 40 hours a week and... Is it wrong for you to desire your paycheck? Is it wrong of you to even demand your paycheck, expect your paycheck? Is it wrong of you? No, absolutely not. It's not wrong of you. Why? Because you deserve your paycheck. So it's not wrong or selfish or, or any of those other things for you to deserve it. It's proper that you should get it because you deserve it. And in the same way, it's not wrong or selfish of God to seek glory for himself. 
It's proper because he deserves it. He's the only one that does. Now, what are the natural implications? We were created for God's glory. What are the, what are the implications of that? Well, first of all, our lives are significant to God. Therefore, they are significant. It doesn't really matter what other people might think of you or me or anyone else for that matter. Our lives are significant to God, and therefore, they are significant. Every human life is significant. It's, it's valuable in God's sight. And since we were created to give Him glory, every single person is important to Him. Another implication of that is that our lives have purpose. We have meaning. We're not just going through 70 or 80 or 90 years spinning around on this rock we call earth just to make ourselves happy, whatever that means, or to fulfill some, some desires in our lives. I mean, really think about what a, a selfish purpose that is, just to fulfill whatever desires I have. Our lives have real meaning real purpose to fulfill the reason that he created us for john 10 10. now this is an important verse for a lot of reasons john 10 10. it's the verse that we we often use in evangelical discussions but this is jesus talking john chapter 10 verse 10. he said the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy but i came that they may have life and have it abundantly. Listen, God created us to have an abundant life. Our lives have purpose. We're not just going through this life just to get along, just to get by. We have a high purpose, the abundant life that God has called us to. And then the other implication of the fact that we're created for God's glory is that fullness of joy, do you want that in your life? Do you look for that in your life, to have a complete joy, a fullness of joy, overflowing peace and rest in God's presence? That's what really joy is. Do you want that in your life? That fullness of joy is found in knowing God and delighting in His presence. See, joy is the fruit of our right relationship with God. It's not something that we can create, that we can pull together and, and by our own efforts, and we just pull ourselves up by our bootstraps. If I try hard enough, I'll have joy. Well, even just saying it that way doesn't sound like it's a lot of joy, does it? Joy is peace that results from the character and the presence of God, knowing that we are fulfilling the purpose that He created us for. Okay, so we've covered some ground. I'm going to look at the time here, see where we are in our, in our time. I don't want to go too far in our discussion as far as I'm spending too much time in a lesson today, and I have lost my mouse again, so I can't seem to find the camera. There we go. Okay, so we're about 25 minutes in, so let's, let's continue in the discussion here. We talked about the fact that we are created with a purpose. We're created to glorify God. Man was created, too, in God's image. Now, this is something of everything that God has created. And God created everything, right? That's what the Scripture tells us. God created everything. John 1, 3, In Him everything was made, and without Him nothing was made that was made. By the way, that's an Awana verse. And so I'll give a quick, cheap little plug for Awana. If you don't have your kids in Awana, put them in Awana. Because not only are they going to learn a lot of verses, but you're going to learn them too as you study the verses with them. Everything that God, everything that is, God created. But of the things that God created, only man is said to be in God's image. Okay? Genesis chapter 1. Now that's the easiest passage you're going to, or easiest chapter you're going to find in any of these studies. First chapter of the Bible, Genesis chapter 1. Verses 26 and 27. And if you've been around church at all, you've heard this before. This, this is past, these passages are not new to you. And then God said, let us make man in our own image. And by the way, there's a reference to the Trinity. We're going to get to that one day in some of these lessons, but not today. But let us make man in our own image. 
according to our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the sky, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that crawls on the earth. And God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, male and female, he created them. Now, in the original Hebrew, think about what that means. We are in the image of God. In the original Hebrew, an image or a likeness, they both refer to something that's similar but not identical to the thing it represents. So we think about what that means. When we're created in the image of God. We're like him in a lot of ways, but not every way. In other words, that does not mean that we are gods. It does not mean that we will be a god over our own universe one day. There is a religious group that teaches that, the Mormons. It doesn't mean that. It doesn't mean that you and I are gods. It means that we are similar to him, but we're not identical to him. That word is used throughout the, the Old Testament. In 1 Samuel chapter 6, verse 5, we're not going to look at that, but you can write it down and check it out if you want. It's used of a model. In Ezekiel chapter 23, verse 14, it's used of a painting. And in fact, the Old Testament, 2 Kings eleven eighteen, 18, even uses that word of idols or statues to mean something that is similar, but it's not identical to the thing it represents. Now, so what does it mean that we are created in the image of God? It means that we are like him in a lot of ways, and we represent him here on this earth. Did you hear, remember what he said there in Genesis chapter 1, in verse 26. Let me just re remind you what it said. We'll create man in our own image, our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, the cattle, and over the earth, and over every creeping thing that crawls on the earth. We are not only like God, but we represent him here in this world. We see and hear and speak and can experience his creation through senses and emotions. We have compassion and seek justice and show mercy and all of those things. And listen, those are qualities that reflect something of God's own character. That's what it means that we are in the image of God. We have this. Nothing else in creation has that aspect to it. They are created in the image of God and they pursue those things. Mercy and justice and compassion. I think we think about not only we are created in the image of God and what that means is that we are moral creatures. You remember we talked about, we said, what is God like? We said God is holy. And as a holy being, God is morally perfect or pure. God is a moral creature. And for you and I, created in the image of God, it means you and I, mankind, are moral creatures. Now, many say that morality doesn't really exist. Morality is whatever society determines it to be. That's what many people would say. And in fact, as we look around society today, that is becoming a, a position that's starting to gain a lot of traction. That whatever society says is right and moral, then that is what is right and moral. There is no outside standard of morality. George Washington said this, we're coming up on a presidential election. I thought it was fitting and apropos to quote George Washington. George Washington said this. He said, "'Tis substantially true." You gotta love the way that old English sounds, right? "'Tis substantially true that, that virtue or morality is a necessary spring of popular government." The rule indeed extends with more or less force to every species of free government. In other words, that society that mor society cannot determine morality. There must be a moral standard outside of man. Listen, you and I both know that mankind is able to justify some of the most deplorable things at times. I mean, for decades even in the United States, the idea of slavery was, was seen as not only just normal and natural, but moral and right. 
Mankind is able to justify some of the most horrible things in our minds, and we can call them moral. We can call them right. We look around society now, and, and things like people will justify in their minds. They'll justify adultery. Sometimes they'll justify murder. They'll justify stealing. Goodness sakes, there's even some discussion in society right now that we should just feel sorry for pedophiles and not call it wrong. Mankind is capable of, of justifying in our hearts. The Bible says our hearts are desperately wicked. We absolutely, there has to be a moral standard outside of and apart from man. And we are moral creatures and we are morally accountable before God. He is the the creator. He is the, the sovereign one. He is the one who created us, not us creating him. And so we are morally accountable before him. Look at what the Hebrew writer said, Hebrews chapter 9. By the way, I refer to him as the Hebrew writer because nobody really knows who wrote Hebrews. It's, it's unanimous, or it's, it's anonymous, I'm sorry, it's anonymous. The, the author never identifies himself. There's a lot of speculation about who it was, and we can get into that one day if you'd like. But for now, let's just call him the Hebrew writer. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27. Inasmuch as it's appointed for man to die once, and after this comes the judgment. Listen, you and I are morally accountable for God. And one day, we talked about this yesterday during the service, that the judgment of God is coming. And one day, every one of us will stand before God as a judge. We are accountable for to him we are moral creatures made in his image and we are accountable to him and mankind has an inner sense of right and wrong unlike anything else in creation i was eating some popcorn the other day and i had my little chihuahua here on my lap as i was eating it and as i went to take a piece of popcorn and put it in my mouth he, he kind of jumped up, and he was going to snatch it out of my hand. Now, when he did that, he didn't have any sense of remorse. He, he, wasn't, he wasn't acting like that was something he was doing that was, he knew was wrong. He just saw something he wanted, and he, and he went for it. He wasn't thinking, oh my goodness, this is not right. I shouldn't, be, I shouldn't take something that doesn't belong to me. Because as a dog, as much as I love my little guy, he doesn't have that inner sense of right and wrong like you and I do. Listen, mankind is different from the rest of creation. Listen to what Paul said in Romans chapter 2. Romans 2, verse 14 and 15. He said, for when Gentiles, and by that he's talking about unbelievers in this context, when Gentiles who do not have the law do instinctively the things of the law, these not having the law are a law unto themselves, in that they show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience bearing witness and their thoughts alternately accusing or else defending them. There is no other creature no, nothing else in all of creation that has that inner sense of right and wrong. Only mankind has that. Because we have the image of God. We're moral creatures just like he is. And when we act according to God's standards, we reflect his holiness. We reflect his righteousness. When we don't, we don't reflect it. We're not operating in accordance with with our our stated purpose we're moral creatures we're also spiritual creatures that's the other thing one of the other things it means about being created in the image of god he is moral we are moral god is spiritual we are spiritual there is an aspect of human life that is immaterial right I mean, you, you recognize that. There is an aspect of us that is not bound by the physical. If it were all physical, all biological, that's all there was, then somebody on life support would be alive, as alive as you and me, right? Well, all you have to do is just keep the body alive. And they'll stay alive. But there is an immaterial aspect to life. 
Listen once again to what the Hebrew writer had to say. Hebrews chapter 4. Now this passage here, he's talking about the Word of God, but there's something significant that I want us to notice here in Hebrews chapter 4. Hebrews 4.12. He says, For the Word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword. But then this is the part I want us to notice. Piercing as far as the division of soul and spirit. There is an aspect of us that is immaterial. And it is this aspect of man that enables us to relate to God. Nothing else in creation can do that. One of the earlier lessons we had was, is evolution compatible with the Bible? And listen, if you and I are ultimately, our, our great, 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 grandfather was an amoeba in a puddle of primordial ooze, that's where we all came from, then we are not radically different than that amoeba. In essence, in nature, there's nothing different between us and that amoeba. But you and I, as people, we have an ability to relate to God in a way that nothing else in creation does. That's what Jesus said. John chapter 4. Jesus here is talking to the Samaritan woman. In John chapter 4, verse 24, this is what he said. He said, God is spirit. Okay, so there's an immaterial aspect of God. God is spirit. And those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. And those two things, those two aspects of worship are both important, spirit and truth. But for the purpose of this lesson, we are spiritual creatures. It's what enables us to relate to God. There is nothing else in creation that can pray and praise and hear him and interact and relate to God like human beings can because we are the only things made in his image. And then the last thing we'll cover today, just for the sake of time, is that we are relational creatures. Now, this is not unique to mankind, but the depth of relationships that humans have is unique. I read something the other day that said the cardinal, you know, that little red bird, beautiful bird, that the cardinal mates for life. And the cardinal's not the only animal in the animal kingdom that, that mates for life. They find one mate, they stay together for the rest of their lives. And so this relational aspect is not unique to mankind. I mentioned our little chihuahua. We have a bit of a relationship with him, and he has a relationship with us. But the depth of human relationships is unique. Genesis chapter 2. Again, that's kind of a softball to find Genesis chapter 2, right? Turn to the beginning. I don't know why I'm having such a hard time finding it, but turn to the beginning. Genesis chapter 2 and verse 24. And of course, the, God is here describing marriage. And he said, For this reason, a man shall leave his father and his mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. And if you're married, that, that passage was probably read or quoted at your wedding. But that kind of relationship, that one flesh kind of union, that's unique to mankind. We are relational creatures, and God created us that way in the way he created nothing else. And marriage itself, it shows an example, of something of the nature of God in that it shows that man and women have equal importance before God, but different roles. Paul talks about that in Ephesians chapter 5. And then he says this in Ephesians chapter 5. Let's just turn there. Let's look at it. Paul there is talking about marriage in Ephesians 5, verses 21 through 33. I'm not going to read the whole thing. But I want you to notice verse 32 of Ephesians chapter 5. After all this discussion about marriage and, and how it works, and even he may, quotes that again, that, that verse in Genesis 2.24 we just looked at, he quotes that again in verse 31, and then he says this in verse 32. This mystery is great, 
but I'm speaking with reference to Christ in the church. As marriage itself shows, there is something of the nature of God and the relationship between God and man in the, in the relationships he creates for us. And that's one of the most significant aspects of our relationalness as humans is our ability to relate to God. Okay, so we've covered a lot of ground today. And what I want to do in our next time, we're going to break this up into two parts, is I want to talk about, this is an important aspect, God's activity to restore his image in man. I want to talk about that next time. And then our responsibility as God's image bearers. What is it that we are responsible to do as his image bearers? How are we responsible to act as his image bearers? But you know, now that I look at the clock, we're 40 minutes in. I think our last lesson was an hour. I think we can cover those last two things in the last 15 minutes. So let's, let's do it. Let's jump in. Okay, so we talked about the fact that we are created for God's glory. That mankind is created in the image of God. We're not exactly like God, but we're an awful lot like Him. We have a lot of His characteristics in us. Now, I want to talk about God's activity to restore his image in man. Not, not reinstall it. It's not gone for good, but to restore it. At the fall, Genesis chapter 3, when sin entered the world, man didn't lose the image of God. It's just not as clearly seen as it once was. It's a little bit clouded now. And because of sin... Every aspect of the image of God is distorted in some way. I mean, we think about some of those things that we just talked about, the, the aspects of the image of God and what that means. That we are moral creatures. And our sense of morality as a human race has been distorted. I mentioned that there are even some in our society that are talking about the fact that we ought to feel sorry for pedophiles rather than putting them in prison. There's a distortion to our morality. We take things that God created as beautiful and perfect and we distort them. Relationships, marriage, there's, there's now the Supreme Court has ruled a couple of years ago that same-sex marriage is okay. It doesn't matter what God says about marriage. We'll redefine that. Then we can, we doesn't matter that God created us as two genders. We'll redefine that to be whatever we want. Our, our sense of morality as a human race has been distorted because of sin. We're spiritual creatures, and that has been distorted because of sin. Many people go around and say, well, it doesn't matter what you believe. Just be sincere, and all religions are the same, and just, just worship God, whoever you believe him or her to be. We're not worshiping the God of the Bible as a, as a human race. We're worshiping a God created in our own image. Our spiritual nature has been distorted because of sin. And then our relationships have been distorted because of sin. I think of things, something as simple as child abuse. The parents, mom and dad, who are supposed to be the ultimate protector of children, and in many cases, they are the ones who are bringing the harm and the horror into those kids' lives. How our relationships have been distorted. Everything. And we don't even lost the image. We still have the image of God. But it, sin has distorted the aspects of the image of God in our lives. That's what's meant by the phrase, total depravity of man. John Calvin coined that phrase in talking about the depth of our sinfulness. And that doesn't mean, we talk about the total depravity of man, it doesn't mean that everything we do is depraved, everything we do is horrible, we're incapable of doing anything good. That's not what it means. Even the absolute worst among us is capable of doing some very good things. But we all have to recognize at the same time that the best among us is capable of doing some tragically horrible things. But that's what's meant by the total depravity of man, that sin has affected every aspect of the image of God in our lives. It distorts our moral judgment, clouds our thinking, hinders our fellowship. But in Jesus, here's the beautiful thing, God's activity to restore his image in man. 
In Jesus, we are regenerated. Now you think about what that word means. Remade. Generated again. Made anew. We are fundamentally changed when we come to a relationship with Jesus. And the image of God is progressively being restored to what it should be. Listen to what Paul said, 2 Corinthians chapter 3. And I just realized we're probably going to go over time today, but you know what? We're rolling now, and this is important, and we're going to talk about it. 2 Corinthians 3 and verse 18. Maybe I should be in 2 Corinthians and not 1 Corinthians. I'm looking at that verse, 1 Corinthians 3.18, and I thought, wow, that's not the verse I thought it was. 2 Corinthians 3.18, But we all with unveiled faces, beholding in a mirror, as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image, from glory to glory, just as from the Lord, the Spirit. When we come to Christ, we are fundamentally changed, regenerated, and the image of God is progressively being restored to what it should be. And so we're going to pick that apart for a minute. When we come to Christ, we're regenerated. Salvation is not a superficial transaction. It's much more than just an outlook modification or an attitude adjustment. There is a popular book right now, and I'm not going to mention the author's name, but you know, probably know who I'm talking about. He's a, a preacher in the States, big flashy smile, he wears a snappy suit every week, he's got great hair. I'm not, I'm not bitter in any way, I'm just saying, he's got great hair. And he, he wrote this book, A Lot of Copies Sold, called Your Best Life Now. That that's kind of all that's required. That's all that salvation is about. This superficial transaction of just getting the best you can out of this world. It's just about an outlook modification. It's just about an attitude adjustment. But in salvation, we are regenerated. It is not a, a superficial transaction. When God affects regeneration in our lives, we are radically changed. Listen to what he said. You know this verse, probably. 2 Corinthians 5.17. If you know it without looking it up, go ahead and quote it. I won't hear you, but go ahead and quote it for your own edification. 2 Corinthians 5.17. I'm going to read it because I want to make sure I get it right. I want to make sure we see it in the Word of God. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, listen, he is a new creature. The old things have passed away, and behold, all things have become new. When God affects regeneration in our lives, it's not an attitude adjustment. It's not an outlook modification. We are new. And it involves passing from spiritual death into spiritual life. That's what Jesus said. John chapter 5, verse 24. Truly, truly, I say to you, Jesus is speaking here, he who hears my voice and believes him who sent me has eternal life and does not come into judgment, but is passed out of death into life. Listen, this is, this is much more than a superficial transaction at salvation. We have passed from spiritual death into spiritual life. And that's one of the reasons why I believe so strongly in the doctrine of eternal security. Because there's nowhere in Scripture where we're told that someone passes from spiritual life back into spiritual death. And if we were to lose our salvation, that's exactly what has to happen. And this new creature that we have become in Christ would now go away. We'd become the old creature again. Salvation is not this superficial transaction, this mere attitude adjustment. There is something profound spiritually that happens. God restores us to a right standing before Him. And He's in the process of restoring the fullness of His image in us. That's what Paul's Romans chapter 8, verse 29. 
For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his Son. When we are saved, when we come to a, a saving relationship in Jesus Christ, God has restored us to a right standing before him, and he is in the process of restoring the fullness of his image in us. Okay, that's God's activity to restore his image in man. Let me wrap it up here with our responsibility as God's image bearers. First of all, you and I are to act as his representatives on this earth. We looked at that in Genesis chapter 1, where it talks about God creating man in his image. And he put us in charge of everything. He delegated his authority to us. And then he says in verse 28 of Genesis chapter 1, he said, God blessed them, Adam and Eve. And God said to them, be, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, subdue it, and rule over the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, and every living creature that moves on the earth. And that doesn't mean that we have free reign to do whatever we want here. We are God's stewards of this planet. We are God's managers. The earth belongs to him. It does not belong to us. And we are God's managers of it. And when we fill the earth with God's image, we demonstrate all the places where he rules and he reigns. We are to act as his representatives on this earth. And as believers in Christ, he has given us the incredible privilege of being his mouthpiece, being his message bearers, his torch bearers, if you will. In Matthew chapter 28, some of the last words that Jesus spoke, we call it the Great Commission. He said, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey all things that I have commanded. Listen, we are his representatives here on earth, and we're called to take care of his creation. He, he put us here to be stewards of this creation in a way that honors him, not to run roughshod over this, but to take care of everything that he has put in our charge. And then we are to cooperate in his plan to restore all things to what they were meant to be. Paul said this in Philippians chapter 2. We'll end with this today. I was going to say again this morning, but we are in the afternoon now. You may watch this in the morning, but I'm recording it in the afternoon. Philippians chapter 2, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, Philippians, General Electric Power Company. That's how I learned those four the, the order of those four books, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, Philippians 2.13. For it is God who is at work in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. We are to cooperate in his plan to restore all things according to his good pleasure with what they were meant to be. Listen, the implications of being created in God's image, they're significant and they're absolutely profound. Every human being, no matter how much our lives have been marred or distorted by sin, every human being still bears the image of God and still then deserves to be treated with dignity and respect that is due God's image. And we have to think about that, especially right now. Our, our nation is deeply, bitterly divided over some things. But still, we have a responsibility to treat every human being with dignity and respect that is due God's image, even and maybe especially those that we disagree with. If we deny or ignore our unique status as God's only image bearers, we'll soon begin to depreciate the value of human life. Listen, we see that right now. The issue of abortion in our, in our day and in our society, that began long before that decision of Roe versus Wade in the early 70s. It began long before that as we began to accept more and more the idea of evolution, it depreciated the value of human life because we, we were ignoring our status as God's image bearers. And we're seeing the fruit of that now. We'll depreciate the value of human life and lose much of the sense of what it means for us to be human. Listen, I hope this has been a blessing to you, this lesson. I, I want to wrap up with this. If you, as we talked about what God has done to restore his image in man. And we talked about that salvation that he has brought in Jesus Christ. And if you're watching today and you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, 
because I don't know that that transaction has ever happened, that I have passed from death into life. I don't know of any period of time that I have done that. I'd love to talk with you. I'd love to sit down and share with you and talk about Jesus, this one who came, so that you could have eternal life and spend eternity in heaven with God. Would you reach out to me, pastor at avianobaptist.church, or you can find me on Facebook, or you can find me on WhatsApp if you're here locally. I'd love to talk with you about your relationship with Christ. I hope this has been a blessing to you as we talk about what is man. In the coming weeks, we're going to talk about things like what is sin? What has Jesus done for us? Really, we're going to pick this idea of, of salvation apart just a little bit more. Who is Jesus and what he's done for us? I hope you have a great week. I hope you are blessed by this, and I hope you stay in God's Word. You stay pursuing Him. You keep thinking about this idea of what has God created you for, and what does it mean that we were made in His image. God bless you, and have a wonderful week.